here to text you, but then to my heart as well. Um, we're trying to make um, technology box accessible for everybody. So this is specific um, uh, fireside chat. Um, it's called making technology accessible for your employees and the community that you serve. So a few housekeeping items before we start. Um, just a reminder, this um, event is being recorded and we're gonna send uh, the record um, in an email. You're gonna get probably in about one or three business days, you're gonna get that email with a recording. Um, you can use a chat function to type in your comments. You can also um, use a, the Q&A function to ask the questions that you might have um, along the event. Um, and let's get started. So I wanted to jump in and then talk a little bit about Quad. So Quad is a brand new um, community that TechSip has put together for all the organizations that we have. And not only with this community, you're gonna have a peer-to-peer -peer, um, experience, you're gonna have exclusive events, you're gonna have expert technical support um, coming from my team. Um, you're also gonna know nonprofits in your area um, and also get additional discounts in the products that you usually get every year um, in TechSoup, as well as some courses and more stuff. Um, you can get also uh, 10 members inside of your organization that can have the quad membership. Um, also, probably one of the things that you're probably going to ask is like, how can I know more information about quad? Um, well, you can join quad with the link that I'm going to send you all in the chat. Um, and then if you have any questions or you want to just chat a little bit more, you can go ahead and then email us at customer success at techsip.org and we can just schedule a call with you and then learn more about Quad. And then who's making this possible? So the customer success is the one that is make these events every month possible. Um, here is probably a little bit of um, everybody. You've probably already talked to a few of these folks. So we have Gerard, Kevin, Tamira, Tony, Ashley, Jonathan, and my person, and Vanessa. Nice meeting you all. If we haven't seen you, but I do see some familiar faces. So welcome again. Um, and excited to have you all back. And then to the ones that I don't know, well, thank you so much for joining and hope that you can um, come along every single month we do these events. And then now let's talk enough about me and enough about TechSoup and then let's meet um, our speakers today. So with me, I have Peter Johnson from Inspire Tech. He's the chief um, technical officer um, and um, a little bit about Peter. Um, he has 30 years tenure at Inspire Tech. He's transitioned from supporting nonprofit tech training for individuals with disabilities to holding the position of Chief Technical Officer. Um, over the fi last 15 years, his responsibilities included designing network infrastructure and phone systems to ensure accessibility for disabled employees, included a substantial number of disabled veterans. Um, also, along um, with Peter, we have Celia uh, Moriton. He, uh, she is a development director at Life Services Alternatives. For 27 years, Celia has been fundraising for nonprofits, including large and small, um, and her experience with nonprofits on both of the East and West Coasts um, has led to success in all aspects of fundraising, from special events to grant writing and much more. She has been working for um, Life Services Alternatives for six years, and she loves working with intellectually and developmentally disabled population. Um, alongside with Celia, we have Brian. Brian Hines is the uh, Human Resources Director at Disability Rights Texas. Um, um, Brian has been um, with the Disability Rights Texas um, organization since January 2019. So he brings over 29 years of experience overseeing legal services and lending a long-term support to care program in Galveston for individuals with traumatic brain and spinal cord injuries, um, as well as his dedication extend to over six years to the HR Southwest Conference Board, showcasing a steadfast of commitment to supporting organizations and initiatives for individuals with disabilities. Um, and I am gonna just take it away with my speakers to see if they wanna, um, um, speak a little bit more about themselves so we can get started with a fireside chat. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about uh, the organization I work for. Um, Inspire Tech started out doing training for people with disabilities, and a lot of the training, uh, the, the disability group that we were aiming for was people who were blind, because we started at the time when JAWS came out. And 
the director of the organization, the president, uh, saw JAWS as an opportunity to allow the emerging technology at that time, which was a PC with one, if not two floppy drives, um, to actually learn programming skills that were sort of emergent at that time at, at the PC level. And a lot of the work was actually um, linking up to mainframe systems to do you know, the, the, the COBOL programming and all that. But um, JAWS allowed that and he saw real possibilities for that and started to uh, started the organization with that goal in mind. And he developed the organization so that we had a real structure that was built around uh, providing support for the uh, our trainees, and you know that meant support for their transportation, support with housing at times, uh, support with uh, getting doctors' appointments and um, making flexible schedules for them. And what he found was that uh, he could train somebody up to make a really good programmer. But very often, what happened was when they got out into the 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 real job market, or the you know, um, they they could get decent jobs and they were capable of doing them, but they didn't have the support that we had provided. And so, very often, their failure to hold the job had nothing to do with their capabilities. It had to do with um, the the lack of support to ensure that they could do that. So he transitioned us from a uh, an organization that provided that training to one that provided jobs. And so we now are do call center work. Um, it's largely in the, the public sector. Uh, we have a fairly large uh, contract with uh, the uh, veteran, the VA, uh, to provide support for their benefits uh, office. And we also work with this in the state of Pennsylvania, the state of New Jersey, uh, to provide support for a couple of government agencies. And it's all inbound support. And uh, we still have people with uh, who are blind, who are doing work. Uh, it is much more limited to what they can do because all of the systems that are used now are web-based. And unfortunately, web developers, the last thing they think about is accessibility. And we have worked at times with, uh, so we have a phone system and we've been through a number of different phone systems. And each time we get a new phone system, the first thing we do is we test it for accessibility, uh, the client for accessibility. And we, will, we have actually gone to the phone system provider and said, you know, you can't actually contract with government agencies with this phone system legally because you don't meet the requirements for accessibility. And so we've had them reprogram and you know they've been very responsive to us. And I think there are a lot of people that we found that want to support our mission. And you know, so uh, given that we are a, an organization that employs people to answer the phone, there are categories of people with disabilities that are never going to be qualified. And you can think right off the bat of somebody with uh, extreme hearing loss, uh, you know, just can't answer a phone. And, uh, you know, we, we've thought about different ways of making that possible, but it slows down the conversation enough that, you know, it's no longer just a language line call. It's a call that, you know, has three or four people involved to get the, the translation done. Um, but, you know, it, it, it was an interesting translate, uh, transition to go from that model of providing the, uh, the training to actually employing the people and providing them with the support that they needed. And so as an organization, we really don't have an HR department as much as what we call a case management department. And our case managers are responsible not only for the hiring and determining what the disabilities are, but for making sure that on the technical uh, side, we can provide those, uh, those support needs. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't work. I mean, you know, we just had somebody who needed to use a certain kind of tablet, which was not going to be compliant with any system that we put together. Um, so, you know, we, we, we are limited in what we can do. And some of that has to do with the projects that we run. But uh, that, that's uh, sort of where, where we are as a, an organization. And I, I think there are a couple of other organizations like us out there who are uh, <clears throat> nonprofits who are actually providing employment and hiring people with disabilities. That's awesome, um, Peter. I, I wanted to um, also um, uh, to kind of like change a little bit of the format of how we usually do our, our monthly events. We usually, you come in, you expect to like learn something um, and we usually go very technical. So I wanted to 
change a little bit today and do like a fireside chat. And I, I, I created a few questions that um, our panelists are gonna kind of like answer um, with their experiences that they come in as well as what they're doing with their organization that they're with. Um, the, first the first question um, is gonna be making um, tech inclusive um, uh, practices inside of organizations. So the first, quest the first question is how can nonprofits implement inclusive employment practices for individuals with disabilities. Um, so Celia or Brian, if you wanted to explain a little bit more about that, um, that would be awesome. Brian, do you wanna go ahead? Sure, I'll, I'll be happy to, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm with an organization called Disability Rights Texas, and we are uh, a protection and advocacy agency for persons with disabilities who live in the state of Texas. We're essentially a public interest or social justice law firm, uh, much like a legal aid. Um, and we specialize in legal services for people who have disabilities who feel that they've been discriminated against uh, for on a variety of reasons based on their disability, uh, whether it be transportation related, housing related, employment related, um, a lot of different uh, issue teams that we have that, that focus on providing that service. And uh, obviously, since we are an organization that uh, someone could come to uh, for legal help and advice uh, or representation because they feel like they weren't treated uh, well in their employment uh, arrangement with their employer, uh, we want to lead by example. And so one of the things that we do is we're very deliberate and intentional on uh, the types of um, web applications, um, uh, content, anything that we provide to our staff, we feel that it has to be compliant um, before we'll roll it out, before we'll make it available. And so uh, we've gone through a lot of, uh, we've spent a lot of time training our staff on how to make documents accessible, how to make sure that communications that we have are accessible, not only in different languages, Languages, but that you know, someone that uh, who uh, is needing assistive software to to access a site or to read a page uh, that they have that that it is accessible. And I'll be honest with you, before I came to work for DRTX, I never thought about that as an HR professional, and um, it does cause a little bit more extra work and more time to make sure that that on the front end is an accessible document before sharing something with all the staff, uh, but. We have staff who are uh, who have uh, a sight impairment, who have uh, a need for uh, some uh, an accommodation to us to assist them with their job, and so uh, we want them to have the same experience as someone who may not have that uh, that need. And so we try, from an HR perspective, to to ensure that everything you know from websites that an employee may have to access. Uh, to you know, communications that we send out about benefits, that all of that is accessible on the front end before we even do that. And so um, I think that has been, we feel like it's been helpful for us to kind of lead by example, if you will, uh, so that uh, our staff have, regardless of, of their, their situation, they have the same access and the same ease of being able to do their job. Okay, well, Life Services Alternatives provides housing and programs to um, adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And we have currently 15 homes throughout our county that, that serve about 80 individuals. And in addition to our housing, we have a program called Community Integration Training Program. And it's really a win-win out in the community and it's open to everyone regardless of whether you're a resident in one of our homes or not. Um, we work with other nonprofits such as the library or um, senior citizen centers or food banks or that kind of thing. And our, um, the participants in the program go there and learn how to do various things at each one of those, those um, nonprofits. So whether they're increasing social skills by serving senior citizens and getting along and talking and having conversations or whether they're actually learning um, at the library, uh, they clean books and they learn to categorize. 
and things such as that. Um, and it's a win-win because those nonprofits need help and volunteers and we're providing volunteers who are learning also a skill that can translate to some kind of a job. Um, it's not real technical at this point, but um, we do provide provide information and um, life skills for them to go on and use this in another position. Thank you so much for that. Um, and then if you are, um, you're here, I'm listening to the conversation. If you have um, answers for the same question, please feel free to um, chime in your question, uh, your answers in the chat. We would love to um, to know what you guys are doing as well. Um, so we can all learn um, from, uh, from this event um, and implement a few things um, in our organizations as well. Um, I think like the other question that I have is, what strategies can nonprofits employ to overcome accessibility challenges in technology, ensuring that individuals with disabilities have equitable access to digital platforms and innovations? Well, I can tell you what we did. Um, during the pandemic, especially when everybody was shut in, just like everybody else in the world, our residents were going a little stir crazy and wanted to participate in in following their interests and, and having access access to um, all the uh, technical things that most everybody else has. So we did some grant writing and several organizations um, gave us money to supply iPads to everyone that wanted one and could use them. And then they brought in um, some people to train which was really good on how to use the iPad. We have um, our 15 homes range from people who are, are very high functioning all the way to people that are completely bedridden that maybe have trachs and different things that, um, so there's a wide range. So a good part of our homes are filled with people that are kind of just like we are, you know, they, they want to be accepted. They want to be they want to um, learn new things. They want to be able to um, find out about all these different things um, in the world. And one of the ways they could do it is doing it on an iPad. But we wrote grants and it worked. For us, we, we try to um, provide you know, multiple methods or ways that someone could uh, access information. Um, and then getting outside help to help us with uh, making sure that any public facing app or um, any content that we put out there is, is compliant uh, and accessible. That's awesome. Peter, do you wanna jump in? Um, we, we've always found that, um, you know, it's, we, we, we really deal with a higher functioning uh, population that I think they're talking about um, because you you have to be able to uh, have some manual dexterity to do data entry um, but you know they that manual dexterity ranges you know people's manual dexterity has, has a vast range and so we we've always tried to accommodate people and it becomes very difficult at times uh, and especially during the pandemic when you couldn't meet with them directly uh, we were interviewing, uh, you know, remotely, hiring remotely, sending equipment out, uh, and trying. Uh, in the IT, in in my department, we rarely know anything about the individual other than they have needs, and their needs are related to something. And but half the problem we have is trying to figure it out without getting the direct information because we shouldn't be. Nobody should be sharing that information. Uh, you know, we're not privy to it. Um, and so it, it's really, for us, it, it's a question of, of listening. And, um, you know, the, the, I think the hardest things are, are, are actually to hear somebody and the anxiety that they, they're feeling about uh, the technology and the jobs and the prospect of not being able to continue working and recognizing that the problem is not really their, their ability as much as, you know, their, the anxiety that they have approaching their work. And um, 
you know, we've gotten much better at doing that, especially remotely, because, you know, when you when you're not sitting at somebody in front of somebody and able to look at their eyes and how they divert them. And uh, it's it's really very difficult. So. Ness, I saw a, a question pop up uh, to, to me and I'll if you don't mind, I'll answer that. Um, okay. So uh, DRTX is um, part of a, a larger network of of all of the PNAs from every state. So there's a PNA for every state, and then there's also um, a PNA uh, designated for Native Americans uh, that's based in the Southwest part of the country. But um, and I put a link to, or well, I think I did in the chat to both our our uh, organization's website, but then our national uh, the National Disability Rights Network, which is the group that all of the PNAs across the country are a part of. Um, so uh, we utilize that that uh, connection with with other PNAs to uh, um, not have to reinvent the wheel, so to speak. So we we reach out uh, in our uh, NDRN, you know, keeps track of of organizations or uh, agencies that have products and services that we know uh, are focused on accessibility and compliance from that perspective. And so uh, we do a little, you know, we utilize. Uh, kind of the internal knowledge that we have, as well as uh, both, you know, myself and our IT manager, uh, we're both very active in in our our industries and in, in, in professional associations that that support those. And so we become aware of of vendors and other uh, products and services that um, we know are are accessible or uh, striving to be you know accessible. And so we we, we kind of utilize. Uh, a lot of different ways, you know, who have you heard that, that, that provides a service in this space that, that we're comfortable with? And, and because of the fact that we do a lot of litigation, we probably are aware of organizations that aren't compliant, you know, don't, you don't have that as one of their uh, tenants. And so it, it may, it's a little easier for us to maybe avoid, avoid those folks um, you know, who have been sued legally that they want to avoid. But um, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, so to speak. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> um, if not, Ari, you can just jump in again, and then um, we can uh, spray in to expand a little bit more. Um, just for the people that are maybe on mobile, um, listening to the webinar and not being able to see the chat, the question uh, that Ari asked was, how do you go about getting outside help to check for that kind of accessibility compliance? So that's what uh, Brian was um, referring to. Um, I think that, you know, we we heard the challenges of like listening um, um, to the community as well as like taking action to those demands. And I think like one of the things that, um, that I wanted to ask is like, how can nonprofits empower their employees with disabilities, creating a work environment that accommodates diverse needs and leverages technology to enhance productivity and inclusion? I'll speak from an HR perspective. We have at DRTX, we have a pretty robust um, uh, reasonable accommodation process. So we make it, uh, we, we <laughs> it was interesting when we started really getting down into the, the nuts and bolts of accessibility, we realized that the form that we had people complete requesting a reasonable accommodation wasn't, wasn't accessible. And so first and foremost, we set up an accommodation request that was accessible that anyone could be able to access and complete. And, and we have a, 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 a you know, we, we do have that interactive process with the employee um, who requests the, the accommodation. Um, and when and, and we talk through, you know, uh, is you know, how, how can we do this? And we'll bring in, you know, if it's a piece of equipment or if it's a, a, a program of some sort that they need to utilize, Obviously, uh, you know, we've got IT right there at the table with us to to help us, you know, navigate that process. And uh, in general, you know, we have an unwritten rule that it it, it would have to be a, a fairly large uh, uh, expenditure for us to not be able to justify this as being reasonable. Um, and so, you know, we've done everything from you know providing uh, particular equipment that's specialized equipment or um, access to certain websites and, and uh, uh, other uh, things like that, to things like, um, um, you know, 
we had an employee who had a, 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 an issue with um, kind of bright lights and, and whatnot. And so we went through it. We bought some new bulbs to put in the, the fluorescent bulbs, uh, things in the ceiling so that it, it, it provided a, an atmosphere where she could do her work and not, not have to leave the office periodically because she had a headache, you know, because it was causing her severe issues with, with vision. So, you know, um, we, we welcome that conversation. You know, in a lot of organizations, you know, when someone mentions mentions the need for an accommodation, that's kind of like, you know, they, they look at it as a red flag and we look at it as an opportunity like, okay, this is great. We're going to through this process, we're going to learn something we didn't know before that might help one of our clients. So um, we try to take that approach and, and instill that in our culture. I was kind of laughing at the uh, fluorescent bulbs because we've got a similar situation here. And the solution we have is that there is a sun visor over that user's station. And, you know, the, the kind you get for a car. And it's like um, she's in her own little tent and she doesn't get the uh, the, the bright light from the fluorescence. And, um, you know, it's just a real cheap accommodation. And then when it works out like that, you can have a sun visor in your office area. So. That's an amazing idea. I love that. <laughs> it was not my idea. I wish I were that clever. <laughs> There is a there's a resource uh, you may already be aware of it. But it's called the Job Job Accommodation Network, Jan, and they have a database of all sorts of accommodations based upon a situation. You see, you can go in and, and search for those types of things. So if you have no idea, if you're kind of stumped on it, what can we do? And if the employee may not be aware of what what they need, you can together sit down and and look through and and see some best practices, and it's it really helps. Um, you know, not having to start from square one, so to speak. I was able to put the link on the chat. So um, thank you so much, Brian, for that. But I just put the link uh, for the Job Accommodation Network so you can learn more um, information on their website as well. Celia, do you want to jump in on the question as well? Well, um, in all actuality, we don't have um, a lot of employees with disabilities because of what we do. Um, we hire RNs and CNAs and and you know direct support people. But what we do with with our clients and their disabilities to get them to be able to do um, what they would like to do because everybody has their own plan. And every person is allowed to um, follow their interests in and um, further their goals. We do whatever it takes to be able for them to do that, whether it means getting new technology or working with somebody or having um, somebody come in that will help them. And it's anything from music therapy to to. Um, just recreational therapy to learning how to do something, you know, and, and it might be because a lot of our clients um, have issues with their body. So it's learning how to use a computer when you can't use your hands very well or that kind of thing. So that's what we do. That's awesome. Thank you so much for what you all do. One of my last questions, and then we are going to um, do a QA and a so everybody can just um, ask us um, some other questions. But my last question for today that I prepare <laughs> is going to be how can um, how we how can we collaborate? I'm sorry, I'm like I don't know how to speak today. <laughs> how can we collaborate as a community to provide more awareness to the challenges in the disability space? Well, I think. Um... Not, uh, I guess. I guess for us, we we really try to make a point to think about that first and not last. If that makes sense, like let's let's don't forget about that and let it just be something that we we stumble upon at the end. Oh yeah, we got we got to make this successful. That needs to be one of the first things out of our mouths. Is okay. This does this. Is it accessible? Is this you know? Does this meet the needs of our of our staff? Is this reflect the type of organization that we say that we are, you know, um, 
and, and uh, we're not perfect by any means, but um, but we try to you know um, incorporate that in a stronger way on the front end. Um, Well, we do a lot of marketing and communications and um, going out and getting involved in things that are in the community, having a booth at a fair or whatever. Um, we also have a couple of events during the year that people can participate in, whether they have um, someone in their family with disabilities or not. Um, and just getting people involved, hearing about the crisis with housing for us that there are for people with disabilities, um, learning just more about what's happening. Um, we do have in San Jose here, there's wonderful places. There's a recovery cafe where they work with people with disabilities and there's Ada's cafe, which, um, all their staff, a woman whose son um, participates in that started this program and they produce wonderful food and it's a, it's like a luncheonette, you can go have lunch and, and just keep everybody aware of what's offered and encourage them to get involved because a lot of people just don't know about the problems that having disabilities creates. I think that uh, my organization's director uh, went to get the government contracts, the the VA department contracts, primarily because he really wanted to hire or be able to and be in a position to hire uh, disabled vets. And I think he did, wanted to do it for two reasons. One is that you know it is something we all care about, but they get so much more visibility than the rest of the disabled population who is uh, disabled for no more intentional reason than the vets were. But uh, it, it, I think he, he wanted that exposure and uh, I think it, it's gotten him exposure and you know it, it's gotten us uh, recognition by uh, a number of, of fairly large uh, organizations. So it's, it, it, you know, we're, we're coming at it from a very different perspective by providing the employment, but, um, I'm not the one that reaches out though. Thank you so much again um, for being here. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to do is that um, I'm gonna go ahead and then um, let our, um, our audience ask the questions that they will like um, to know a little bit more, or if you have um, any, or if you're interested in any of the answers from our panelists, but you want them to uh, expand a little bit more, please. Uh, feel free to do so. I'm going to start with one of the questions that um, that it was posted uh, from Roger um, a little while ago, and is, do you have any recommendations for places to learn digital accessibility for working towards IAAP certifications? Hmm. I'm not certain. I do not. Um, it's okay. I have to get back to you. Yeah, let's. Um, so what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna go ahead and then um, um, we're gonna research a little bit. We're gonna get back to you via email. Um, so Roger, if you wanna um, um, if you wanna jump in um with um with your email address, you can just go ahead and then instead of two to everyone, you can select host and panelist, and I can just grab your email right there. Um, and then we're gonna get back to you um on that question a little bit more, um, and see what other resources we can provide you. But that is a really good question, so thank you so much for that. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to uh, put them on the chat, or you can use the Q and A. Uh, bunch of, okay, there you go. Thank you, Roger. We, we just got your email right here. Um, if you can do the Q&A section, that's fine as well. Or if you can, um, if you can just put it on the chat, that's good as well. Um, so you can um, get to your questions here. Um, I feel like I wanted to uh, for you guys to expand a little bit more. Um, oh, there you go. We have a question. So the never mind. <laughs> um, 
So I, I see from, I guess, you're saying it sounds like CELIS organization is closer to what we do when providing technology with adults with IDD. What is your advice on defining the line between accessibility and reasonable security? I'm sorry, the, could you repeat the last part of that question? Yeah, so they're, they're asking, what is your advice on defining the line between accessibility and reasonable security? Well, again, um, I don't know if it's just here in California, but everything is kind of individually based. And so um, when a plan is made and goals are set for someone that's in one of our homes, um, we do everything possible to provide the technology they need if they need it, instruction or any of that kind of thing. Um, and if it's if it's something that um, we've never worked with before or can't, we try to find an, an answer, an expert or something of someone that can help to to um, be able to enable the resident to do what they what they are hoping to do or to reach a new goal. It's uh, being a nonprofit, um, some things have to do with cost. So you cannot always just purchase new equipment or do what it is. You have to find a way to pay for it. So um, we use a lot of different ways. You know, you make connections out in the community um, with people that that um, can provide things like TechSoup for a reasonable price. Um, and we do that. I mean, there might be a little bit of time to wait, but but we do as much as we can. Um, thank you so much for that, Celia. Um, Rebecca, if you uh, need anything um, anything to expand a little bit more, let us know. Uh, we have a question from Sophia uh, saying, the deaf and hard of hearing community has their own culture, where some identify as having a disability and some do not. How can someone obtain new hearing aids for work if they do not have the funds for it? Maybe we can explain a little bit more about like how we can toggle that. Um, well, I, I am sure there's um, some available resources. I don't know where this person is that that is asking the question, but um, I would start maybe um, with some kind of organization for the hearing impaired and go from there. Um, there are a lot of funds that um, go to various things like that that people don't know about and not are not always used. But I think that's that's what I would do. I would there has to be an organization in the area that has something to do with um, with uh, deafness or or hearing impaired, and they would be a good starting point to to ask those questions to. And, yeah. and Oh, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> no, I was I was just gonna say that um I, I, that's our approach as well. I mean, through our, our community partners, other uh, advocacy organizations or uh, disability organizations, um our attorneys and and uh, ad advocates or uh, they're aware because most of our staff, uh, particularly our advocates, you know, come out of uh, industry. They either worked in the education field or they've worked, um, you know, for a state organization or they've worked, you know, at the federal level and uh, they're not happy with maybe how things were going and they want to make a, you know, a difference and, and, and impact systemic change. So they have contacts in the community and they have contacts with, with other organizations. So we just utilize that network and, and um, because you're exactly right, Cecilia, there's a whole lot of services out there that people aren't aware of. I mean, we find they're not aware of who we are, so that we know they don't know other organizations as well. So it's just, you know, who do we know that that does this? I, you know, I see messages come across our 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 teams all the time. You know, to staff saying, "Hey, I've got a client that, uh, say, for example, is in need of, of uh, hearing devices. It's going to happen. They don't 
you know, uh, they don't have the funds, they don't have the capability of buying it. How do they get it? And nine times out of 10, there's someone that has a connection that says, okay, this, you know, this group is doing that, or there's there's something going on right right now that they can take advantage of. So that's that's how we do it. Also, here in California, um, if you have a developmental disability or an intellectual disability, you go through one of our regional centers. Regional centers cover certain, each one covers certain counties. And I would contact your regional center and your caseworker and ask. That is a really um, that is a really good answer. Um, and I I wanted to also talk a little bit more about about that, right? Like how can we, as you know, uh, well, you guys as a specialist in the field, how we can combat that, right? Like when somebody, um, what Sophia was saying, when somebody ident uh, identifies themselves as having a disability and some do not, um, how we can bring awareness awareness to the entire community to to know that? I think like that's also something that that we're battling also as an organization um, with some, you know, some employees that may have disabilities, but they do not want to disclose it. Um, and how we can, how we can make sure that we're providing what they need as well. Well, I would think it's up. That makes it kind of up to the person that they don't want to expose it to everyone to go to their manager or supervisor, whoever, and say, I'm having problems with this and it's because of this, but, um, and hopefully you'll be able to provide what they need to be able to do their job. But it's, I think in that case, it's um, really dependent on how much the person is willing to say, I have this issue and I need help. I have a question here saying when providing devices in shared living facility with access to the internet that are com uh, communal accessible, how will you use your judgment to protect them from potentially harm con harmful content, but also allow them to use the devices how they would like to? So I think like it's more about like how um how we can set up boundaries with the uh with the devices that we're providing, um, as well as letting them have um, you know, the the autonomy to kind of search for what they want. Well, all our residents are adults. So um, we don't have the, the problem that you might have with teenagers or younger children. Um, and I'm sure in the homes, there are maybe some restrictions or maybe parameters. I'm not sure what they are, but everybody in our home is over 21. That makes it a little bit easier, huh? <laughs> well, and prior to coming to DRTX, you mentioned um, I, I uh, ran a, a, a assisted living facility uh, in Galveston that uh, catered to folks who had a traumatic brain injury or acquired brain injury, and all of our residents were adults. And um, you know, we're fortunate that we didn't have shared. Um, access to the internet. Uh, they had their own personal internet access and this was their home. Um, they had privacy to do what they wanted to do. I mean, just like they would if they lived somewhere else. So we, we, we and we trained our staff to be aware of that and not to be, not to feel like they needed to impose their opinions or their perspectives, their background, their beliefs on this person, uh, you're working in their home and you may see something that you can see all the time, but this is their home. Right. And, uh, you know, we did have, we had a resident that was a quadriplegic, qualified for our program because of his injury. And, and um, you know, there were times when we would go to his room to search the internet and we, you know, that was his private, space and uh, he had the ability to do that and uh, that was just something that we you know made our staff aware of that you know during certain times not before you go in uh this is his his home and so yeah. I, mean, that helped it. I think that you bring up really good point right and, and then it's also 
um, the awareness part that we were talking about, right? Like how we can make it just as seamly as possible for everybody involved. And that's perfectly it. You know, the example that you put in, Brian, is making sure that people feel that they want to do what they feel like they want to do, right? Uh, without any restrictions. And I think like that, that brings that humidity, uh, the community point back about like how what we can do to facilitate the the programs and the software and everything but like letting people actually take um dad and then do whatever that they feel like to so i think like that that's a really excellent point um that you brought up too um i think we are almost on time so um I just wanted to say again, thank you so much to everybody um, that joined us today. It has been a pleasure to have you here. It has been a pleasure to see some familiar faces as well as some brand new ones. Um, it has been a pleasure to uh, be with um, here with um, my amazing panelists um, today. So Leah, thank you so much. Peter, thank you so much. And Brian, thank you so much. Um, it has been a pleasure to talk with you guys. Um, and to the audience, if you want to join um, this monthly events, please feel free um, to do so by the link that I posted on the chat. You're going to get notified um, via email whenever that we post another of these monthly um, events. Um, we do a lot of trainings. We do a lot of um, conversations like what we did today. Um, and we're trying to make sure that whatever that you get from TechSoup, you use it because there's not... Um, there's nothing that I dislike the most that people get in something that they don't need or that they don't use. So for me, my personal mission is making sure that you use whatever that you get from us. So um, thank you again, and we'll see each other on March. <laughs> see you all soon. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.